fellow feeling. The Madras Bangalore Express was due to start in a few minutes. Trolleys and barrows piled with trunks and beds rattled their way through the bustle. Fruit sellers and beady and beetle sellers cried themselves hoarse. Latecomers pushed, shouted and perspired. The engine added to the general noise with the low monotonous hum of its boiler. The first bell rang, the guard looked at his watch. Mr. Rajamayar arrived on the platform at a terrific pace, with a small roll of bedding under one arm and an absurd yellow trunk under the other. He ran to the first third-class compartment that caught his eye, peered in and, since the door could not be opened on account of the congestion inside, flung himself in through the window. Fifteen minutes later Madras flashed past the train and window framed patches of sun-scorched roofs and fields. At the next halt, Mandakam, most of the passengers got down. The compartment built to seat eight passengers, four British troops, or six Indian troops now carried only nine. Rajamaya found a seat and made himself comfortable opposite a sallow, meek passenger, who suddenly removed his coat, folded it and placed it under his head and lay down, shrinking himself to the area he had occupied while he was sitting. With his knees drawn up almost to his chin, he rolled himself into a ball. Rajamaya threw at him an indulgent, compassionate look. He then fumbled for his glasses and pulled out of his pocket a small book, which set forth in clear tunnel the significance of the obscure Sandai rites that every Brahmin worth the name performs thrice daily. He was startled out of this pleasant languor by a series of growls coming from a passenger who had got in at Cat Party. The newcomer, looking for a seat, had been irritated by the spectacle of the meek passenger asleep and had enforced the law of the third class. He then encroached on most of the meek passenger's legitimate space and began to deliver home truths which passed by easy stages from impudence to impertinence and finally to ribaldry. Rajamaya peered over his spectacles. There was a dangerous look in his eyes. He tried to return to the book, but could not. The bully's speech was gathering momentum. What is all this? Rajamayar asked suddenly, in a hard tone. What is what? growled back the newcomer, turning sharply on Rajamayar. Moderate your style a bit, Rajamayar said firmly. You moderate yours first, replied the other. A pause. My man, Rajamaya began endearingly, this sort of thing will never do. The newcomer received this in silence. Rajamaya felt encouraged and drove home his moral, just try and be more courteous, it is your duty. You mind your business, replied the newcomer. Rajamaya shook his head disapprovingly and drawled out a no. The newcomer stood looking out for some time and, as if expressing a brilliant truth that had just dawned on him, said, You are a Brahmin, I see. Learn, sir, that your days are over. Don't think you can bully us as you have been bullying us all these years. Rajamaya gave a short laugh and said, What has it to do with your beastly conduct to this gentleman? The newcomer assumed a tone of mock humility and said, Shall I take the dust from your feet, O holy Brahmin? O Brahmin, Brahmin! He continued in a sing-song fashion, Your days are over, my dear sir, learn that. I should like to see you trying a bit of bossing on us. Whose master is who? asked Rajamaya philosophically. The newcomer went on with no obvious relevance. Their cost of mutton has gone up out of all proportion. It is nearly double what it used to be. Is it? asked Rajamaya. Yes, and why? continued the other. Because Brahmins have begun to eat meat and they pay high prices to get it secretly. He then turned to the other passengers and added, and we non-Brahmins have to pay the same price, though we don't care for the secrecy. Rajamaya leaned back in his seat, 
reminding himself of a proverb which said that if you threw a stone into a gutter it would only spurt filth in your face. And, said the newcomer, the price of meat used to be five annas per pound. I remember the days quite well. It is nearly twelve annas now. Why? Because the Brahmin is prepared to pay so much, if only he can have it in secret. I have with my own eyes seen Brahmins, Pukka Brahmins with sacred threads on their bodies, carrying fish under their arms, of course all wrapped up in a towel. Ask them what it is, and they will tell you that it is plantain. Plantain that has life, I suppose. I once tickled a fellow under the arm and out came the biggest fish in the market. Hey, Brahmin, he said, turning to Rajamaya, what did you have for your meal this morning? Who? I? asked Rajamaya. Why do you want to know? Look, sirs, said the newcomer to the other passengers, why is he afraid to tell us what he ate this morning? And turning to Rajamaya, mayn't a man ask another what he had for his morning meal? Oh, by all means. I had rice, ghee, curds, brinjal soup, fried beans. Oh, is that all? asked the newcomer, with an innocent look. Yes, replied Rajamaya. Is that all? Yes, how many times do you want me to repeat it? No offense, no offense, replied the newcomer. Do you mean to say I am lying? asked Rajamaya. Yes, replied the other, you have omitted from your list a few things. Didn't I see you this morning going home from the market with a banana, a water banana, wrapped up in a towel, under your arm? Possibly it was somebody very much like you. Possibly I mistook the person. My wife prepares excellent soup with fish. You won't be able to find the difference between tall soup and fish soup. Send your wife, or the wife of the person that was exactly like you, to my wife to learn soup making. Hundreds of Brahmins have smacked their lips over the tall soup prepared in my house. I am a leper if there is a lie in anything I say. You are, replied Rajamaya grinding his teeth. You are a rabid leper. Whom do you call a leper? You. I? You call me a leper? No. I call you a rabid leper. You call me rabid? The newcomer asked, striking his chest to emphasize me. You are a filthy brute, said Rajamaya. You must be handed over to the police. Bah! exclaimed the newcomer as if I didn't know what these police were. Yes, you must have had countless occasions to know the police, and you will see more of them yet in your miserable life, if you don't get beaten to death like the street mongrel you are, said Rajamaya in great passion. With your foul mouth you are bound to come to that end. What do you say? shouted the newcomer menacingly. What do you say? You vile humbug! Shut up, Rajamaya cried. You shut up. Do you know to whom you are talking? What do I care who the son of a mongrel is? I will thrash you with my slippers, said Rajamaya. I will pulp you down with an old rotten sandal, came the reply. I will kick you, said Rajamaya. Will you? howled the newcomer. Come on! Let us see. Both rose to their feet simultaneously. There they stood facing each other on the floor of the compartment. Rajamaya was seized by a sense of inferiority. The newcomer stood nine clean inches over him. He began to feel ridiculous, short and fat, wearing a loose dhoti and a green coat, while the newcomer towered above him in his grease spotted khaki suit. Out of the corner of his eye he noted that the other passengers were waiting eagerly to see how the issue would be settled and were not in the least disposed to intervene. Why do you stand as if your mouth was stopped with mud? asked the newcomer. Shut up, Rajamaya snapped, trying not to be impressed by the size of the adversary. 
Your Honor said that you would kick me, said the newcomer, pretending to offer himself. Won't I kick you? asked Rajamaya. Try. No, said Rajamaya, I will do something worse. Do it, said the other, throwing forward his chest and pushing up the sleeves of his coat. Rajamaya removed his coat and rolled up his sleeves. He rubbed his hands and commanded suddenly, stand still. The newcomer was taken aback. He stood for a second baffled. Rajamaya gave him no time to think. With great force he swung his right arm and brought it near the other's cheek, but stopped it short without hitting him. Wait a minute, I think I had better give you a chance, said Rajamaya. What chance? asked the newcomer. It would be unfair if I did it without giving you a chance. Did what? You stand there and it will be over in a fraction of a second. Fraction of a second? What will you do? Oh, nothing very complicated, replied Rajamaya nonchalantly, nothing very complicated. I will slap your right cheek and at the same time tug your left ear, and your mouth, which is now under your nose, will suddenly find itself under your left ear, and, what is more, stay there. I assure you, you won't feel any pain. What do you say? And it will all be over before you say Shri Rama. I don't believe it, said the newcomer. Well and good. Don't believe it, said Rajamaya carelessly. I never do it except under extreme provocation. Do you think I am an infant? I implore you, my man, not to believe me. Have you heard of a thing called Jujitsu? Well, this is a simple trick in Jiu-Jitsu perhaps known to half or dozen persons in the whole of South India. You said you would kick me, said the newcomer. Well, isn't this worse? asked Rajamaya. He drew a line on the newcomer's face between his left ear and mouth, muttering, I must admit you have a tolerably good face and round figure. But imagine yourself going about the streets with your mouth under your left ear. He chuckled at the vision. I expect at Jalapat station there will be a huge crowd outside our compartment to see you. The newcomer stroked his chin thoughtfully. Rajamaya continued, I felt it my duty to explain the whole thing to you beforehand. I am not as hot-headed as you are. I have some consideration for your wife and children, it will take some time for the kids to recognize Papa when he returns home with his mouth under. How many children have you? Four. And then think of it, said Rajamaya. You will have to take your food under your left ear, and you will need the assistance of your wife to drink water. She will have to pour it in. I will go to a doctor said the newcomer. Do go, replied Rajamaya, and I will give you a thousand rupees if you find a doctor. You may try even European doctors. The newcomer stood ruminating with knitted brow. Now prepare, shouted Rajamaya, one blow on the right cheek. I will jerk your left ear, and your mouth. The newcomer suddenly ran to the window and leaned far out of it. Rajam decided to leave the compartment at Jalapit. But the moment the train stopped at Jalapit station, the newcomer grabbed his bag and jumped out. He moved away at a furious pace and almost knocked down a coconut seller and a person carrying a trailload of colored toys. Rajamaya felt it would not be necessary for him to get out now. He leaned through the window and cried, Look here. The newcomer turned. Shall I keep a seat for you? asked Rajamaya. No, my ticket is for Jalapat, the newcomer answered and quickened his pace. The train had left Jalapat at least a mile behind. The meek passenger still sat shrunk in a corner of the seat. Rajamaya looked over his spectacles and said, Lie down if you like. The meek passenger proceeded to roll himself into a ball. Rajamaya added, 
Did you hear that bully say that his ticket was for Jalapit? Yes. Well, he lied, he is in the fourth compartment from here. I saw him get into it just as the train started. Though the meek passenger was too grateful to doubt this statement, one or two other passengers looked at Rajamaya skeptically, 